So anyway, I, I was handcuffed. In fact, I was handcuffed around behind my back. And I was taken outside, colder than hell, and the state trooper told me to get down on my knees. And so he kind of ed edged me down there on my knees and I was handcuffed behind my back. And there was a whole line of guys there, five or six of them, maybe more, were all laying down, face down in the snow. And about that time, some Fridley, Minnesota cop, some policeman comes along and shoves me in the middle of my back and pushes me over on my face in the snow. And I land right on my face without any ability to put your hands out. You don't do anything, but just land on your face. And so there I am laying in my face, laying on my face in the snow, in the cold. And some cops just saying, look, I told you to lay on your face. And of course, that cop had told me shit. Anyway, I don't have to tell you about how the hell I got to this position. So stay tuned. Well, let me back up at the beginning. I was just finished a gig working for Brandon Fairlines. I was back in Fort Worth and I'd been flying my butt off. I was running up bills all over town, Alta Vista Airport, Meacham Field, uh, Mangum Airport. I had gas bills running out my ears. I was renting airplanes and I was paying for instruction because I was trying to finish up all my ratings private pilot, instrument pilot, multi-engine, all this stuff was just practically breaking the bank. And poor little Jane, she and her sister were working that peach orchard, doing the best they could, threshing peaches and selling peaches and taking care of that orchard and driving peaches to Dallas every morning before daylight to get to the farmer's market. Doing okay, but anyway, I found myself in this position and I needed another job. Well, a man that I had known named Jim Keithus, a man of Greek descent, smoked a pipe, had kind of small yellow teeth and a really wonderful personality and an interesting guy. And I had met him before downtown in Fort Worth Police Department when I had gotten my PI license when I was working for that asshole Don March. Don Marsh. <clears throat> Jim Keith has offered me a job. He said he was looking for uh, some help working in the uh, PI business and he understood that I had my license. And so he calls me finds my number somehow and calls me. And I said, you know, well, I pretty much had my fill of doing domestic PI work. I got hated that schlepping around, trying to catch some boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband cheating on their spouse. And that's all that that other company I'd worked for did. And he said, no, no, he doesn't do that at all. This is all strictly legit, really legit work. And I said, well, like what? He said, well, I mostly do insurance work. We do catching people that are doing bad things, and the insurance companies usually pay us to try to go out and find out whether their claims are legitimate. So, sounded like a pretty good job to me. The salary seemed okay. <clears throat> I had to drive to Dallas to interview. The company was called Universal Investigations. Really nice offices located in the, the north, just near north part of Dallas. And I met the principals in this company three ex-FBI agents had formed this company and they knew Jim because Jim had been a detective somewhere back east and they all knew him and so he was hired and brought on board. They had a crew of about six or eight men, uh, one lady, I'm sorry, six, six men and one lady that uh, worked for this company. Now the three main bosses were just legit as they could be. They were real live, very nicely dressed, handsome men that owned this company. <clears throat> they were looking for somebody to help Jim, and he was out doing a bunch of work for the Austin Bridge Company and a couple of other big contracting companies that had had these claims filed against them. So I'm, my job is to learn how to pretext, to get film, run a camera, show up super early in the morning to see if these yahoos are showing up at a job where they're not supposed to be working because they're laid up because they're invalid, because of their these huge claims they're making against the insurance companies. Well, we come up with every kind of trick in the world to get these people to do something or try to watch them, observe them do something, get them on film so that we could take it back to court and the lawyers could prove that these guys are lying through their teeth because there's nothing wrong with them at all, but they're still like you're sitting there at home collecting these humongous insurance checks. And I did that, and we've been doing that for a few months, a couple of months. 
uh, working air, out at the airport they were building. I was working on bridge contracts, chasing people down. Sometimes you'd find people in their house, and Jim was a master at being able to put on a Texas utility service cap and knock on the door and say he had some gas leak at the back and wanted to know if we could just put a sniffer and check it out. And he'd, he'd have me off somewhere else filming this whole backyard scene, and he'd talk this guy into digging a hole, seeing if we could pick this miss sniffer to find the gas leak. And for this poor son of a bitch, he didn't realize it. He just, he's digging like a son of a gun, and he's supposed to be on full disability and a back brace. Because the next time I see him in court, he walks in, and he's got his arm in a sling, and he can't hardly move. And then, of course, we roll the film, and there he is. What a bunch of shit. But that's what the job was. I'm in the middle of doing this job, and I find out from Jim Keithas that there's this other job they want me to do. It's an undercover job. This undercover job is working for the Target stores. These people had security contracts with great big stores. I mean, humongous stores. And one of them was the Target company. They were in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, their home offices. And their biggest warehouse that they had was in Fridley, Minnesota. And it was in Hennepin County. And I was hired to go do an undercover job working for that company going completely, totally undercover. I was given all this false data that was worked with, I believe, the county in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, Cameron County, I think it was. And Hennepin County, which is where Fridley, Minnesota is. There were very few people who knew who I really was. They had created for me a complete false identity, had a fake identification, a fake Texas driver's license, social security card, all this stuff was worked out with the state of Texas, Cameron County, Hennepin County, and I don't think Fridley, Minnesota, I think the police department was even involved because there were two people in Minnesota that knew who I was, the CEO of the company and the man that hired the people in the warehouse. He was an unavoidable person they had to contact to get me hired. So I went off and did this job. I flew to Minnesota. They had bought me a local car to drive, an old Mustang, and it was a local car with local plates. Everything from the car, its registration, who it would be registered to, if they did any checks on me for what, who I was supposed to be, it would actually turn up that I was wanted in Brownsville, Texas on wants and warrants, that I was uh, an escape from a county facility, and that I could be extradited back to Texas. That was all put in place by the powers that be that could put me in a position of having to be undercover working at this job. Now, about halfway through this is we're getting ready to do this job and they're instructing me on what to do and how to do it, how to write the reports and how, where I was gonna live, what the job would be. I realized that I'm just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into this shit. It's, this is the real deal. This is like, this isn't any fancy part-time crap. I mean, this is undercover, serious undercover and they're covering it so bad because this is going to be a life or death deal. In other words, if these people find out who you are and you turn up to be that these people are somehow connected, your life could be in danger. So we've got to do everything we can to protect you. <clears throat> now, forgive me if this episode turns out to be just a little longer than these five, six minute things I'm used to turning out because I'm going to try to tell you this story. They hire me and they hire me, this, or they buy this car for me to have when I get off the airplane. They take me to where the keys are, and this man that is going to be the CEO of the corporation, the whole corporation, CEO, he drives me to pick up this car and wishes me luck. That's the last time I see him for about three months, a little over. I'm supposed to, I've got these orders that are coming to me, and they're given to me and delivered to me by a red-headed deputy sheriff for Hennepin County, which is in Fridley, Minnesota. And he's my only legal contact there that knows who I am, that I'm really an officer of the law, that I'm working in cooperation with a major security company, and I'm going undercover inside the Target warehouse. So they make some arrangements to get the guy that had the job I had before I went there to get fired for some made up reason, but whatever, he gets fired. Then the guy that's the personnel director at the warehouse, who also knows who I am, he comes in and I have to make an application. But there's like this application to be made, a waiting period, so I come in and turn in an application. I show them that my experiences before 
was in line with what they were hiring, which was a maintenance director, somebody empty the trash. And the reason they wanted to give me that job is this man, this person at this job, they suspected of having been involved in this ring of thieves that's in this place. Now, let me talk about this. They're losing a hundred thousand dollars a month out of this warehouse and they want to stop it. They want to figure out what's happening, how it's happening, because they know for it to be this pervasive, it's got to be all over the warehouse. People, big, too big a small to plan, too big a plan deal to have only been known by a couple of three people. So they don't know if this, they think it runs all the way up through law enforcement. They don't know. They're, they really don't know. That's why nobody in the company knows anything about what's going on. <clears throat> My job is to run around on this thing called a mule, electrically driven thing that pulls around trash containers. Mostly I have this job because I'm the only one in the company that has this big pile of ring of keys and I have keys to everything. Every door, every lock, every security closet, the cage where they kept all the jewelry and stuff. This place, by the way, is humongous. It's so huge. It's got these pickers that run it up and down on on uh, forklifts that go up and down and pull down and they put together these trains of, of bins and platforms that get rolled around to the shipping docks and they load these trucks up with everything that's going out to Target stores. So my job is to get in with these guys to figure out who's who and who's, you know. So they set me up with this persona. I have a, they call me Tex because they had given me an ID that said my name was Troy Robert Lee. So Tex Lee, who is, they, I was kind of known by, the, guy, the Minnesota guys like to call me Tex. They shaved my head. I was bald-headed, so I kind of looked mean for being a young guy with a baby face. And I was supposed to be copping an Abbott attitude, but anybody that gave me any shit <clears throat> to make it seem like I was sort of an untouchable ne'er-do-well. I was to tell the truth where I was from and that, that I was, maybe there were some people looking for me in Texas. That's kind of all I ever said. So I became, over time, weeks, months, eventually, who were the players? Who did you sit and drink with? Because I used to play hockey in Colorado, these guys have amateur hockey leagues. They had told me that, and they had me bring my skates. So I used to goof around with them in the evenings and you know, drink with them, hang out with them. Um, I wasn't making many inroads, and so... Uh, one of the lead detectives back in Dallas had told me to try to pull some incident that would establish me as being sort of like somebody you just don't want to fuck with. And so one night at a bar, off in the wind, in cold Minnesota dark, we were at this small bar with three or four of the guys. And I knew a couple of them were probably in this group that were robbing Target Blind. And so uh, some guy came along and I used to wear a black hat, a cowboy hat. Hence the reason they call me Tex. And so he takes my hat and he tips it up. And so I make a big deal about this because I knew a lot of cowboys back in Texas. You don't mess with their hat. So this happened. And so what I did about it is I stood up, I busted a bottle of beer on the table and turned around and grabbed this guy by his hair and stuck this bottle in his throat. And I told him, and anybody else who wants to stop and fuck with my hat, that just get ready because if you do, it'll be the last thing you do. Well, these guys pull me off of him, grab the bottle, and they're like, hey, Tex, calm down. God damn, buddy. You know, you just, you know. But that was kind of the incident that finally pushed them over the edge to figure that, you know, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I'm approachable. Because it wasn't too really long after that, maybe a week, that they finally somebody approached me about would I have any objection if they needed to get a key to one of the outside receiving docks. Man, I'd been working on this case for two months before that happened. And so, and I'm writing reports every night in this apartment that they had rented for me. There's basically no furniture. There's a table, a chair, two chairs in the kitchen, a chair in the living room, and a mattress on the floor. And I'm this old beat up Mustang I'm driving that I have no idea who this is registered to or where it came from. And this apartment I'm living in that I find out later that I met a bartender somewhere and he had helped arrange the lease of this apartment, not knowing who he was really for. He just was told to do this by somebody. And so it's all so hush-hush and up undercover that you can't imagine that the trouble that they go to to be sure that they do things to try to keep you safe. So eventually, after a long period of time, 
And after working out the details of how we were going to do, they wanted to do a live on, they wanted to catch these guys in the act. Nothing short of me telling them what was happening, because I did find out what was going on. They were burying products in the snow outside the rail cars before they would ship. And they were taking these things before they were even come in for inventory and putting them down inside the rail cars in the snow. And then trucks were coming along later at night and taking the merchandise. Sometimes they were going out through the receiving docks, but that was with that other maintenance guy. He was unlocking the doors and pushing things out on the ledges and shutting them. And he would do that on four or five doors. And these guys would come swooping in into a couple of trucks and just unload things real quick and take off. So <clears throat> we did that actually twice successfully. I put stuff out there and they took off and came and got it. Um, I knew who I was talking to. I knew who the suspects were. I had a pretty good idea by now because I'd been putting them in my reports every day. I had to write a report every day about what happened today, who occurred, who I talked to. Okay, so now the big night comes because this detective, this redheaded detective from Hennepin County, he tells me how we want this to go down. We're going to do this this particular night. This place has all been set up. I knew I told them that there was going to be another one of these incidents where I'm going to put all this stuff out there. And he said, well, tonight we're going to bust them down. So here's what I want you to do. This is all going to go down during your meal times. So when we they show up, we're going to make this all happen. So you're going to be in the lunchroom having supper. So it's about nine o'clock at night. I'm working an afternoon shift. And all I do is empty trash and go put it in a burner and drive around with these big bins of garbage. And there was a couple of these guys that worked in this place, including the assistant manager, and they hated my guts. They didn't understand how come I got hired. It was somebody other friend they wanted to get through this job, but I get hired over everybody else for some reason. So they already resent me terribly. Uh, no, no fan of any of the management, I can tell you. So anyway, I go to the lunchroom, sit down, I'm having lunch. This is supposed to be a big night. And to let, I, know that, I let them know this is what they're doing. They usually come pick it up not too many hours after dark. And um, so I'm having my dinner. And so I hear the outside commotion going on. There's cars and screaming and yelling, a couple of gunshots. You can hear the sound like firecrackers popping outside. And I'm like sitting there eating my dinner going, God. Dang, this is really happening. It's going down right now. I mean, I was just literally shaking in my shoes. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do other than I was supposed to wait here. And I was told that when that deputy, the redheaded deputy, hits that front door, I'm supposed to get up and head for the side door and make a dashboard like I'm trying to run away. And that's all I was told. Just try to try to get away. So he comes in. I hear all the commotion. About that time, I see the door bust open. And it's, you know, it's 70 yards from where I'm sitting. It's 50 yards or so. And I see him coming in the door. And what I do, well, I scoot my chair back real quick and I get up and I dash for the side door. And I just start running like hell. And about that time, he pops off a 357 Magnum shot at the ceiling. Just, <laughs> stop, halt, or I'll shoot. I mean, my heart's in my throat. My hands are up over top of my head. Just about that time, the door I was heading before, two Minnesota state troopers. I mean, these are the real dude, rest up guys, come walking through that door. And when they do, they walk up to me and turn me around and pull my hands around behind me and cuff me. And so they're putting cuffs on me. And as they were walking, he said, let's go outside. That's all I hear. And they walk me through the lunchroom, out through the doors that the de deputy and his other that sheriff deputy said just come through busting through and we go outside and they put me sit me down in the parking lot where all these guys had already been arrested and there's a lot of commotion still going on and so this guy he tells me he says get down on your knees just right here and he calls out my name i mean just like that it just freaked me out because this true trooper and he calls out my name and he says uh hey tex get down here and stay right down on your knees just stay right here and so I thought, how the hell does he know my name? And because I, I, the, I'm sure that there was supposed to be some arrangement they were going to make to tie me into this big bust that they're having to keep me out of the, how would I know anything about this? And so about that time, of course, that's when some 
local cop comes by and sees me on my knees and everybody else laying on their face. And he pushes me over and I land right smack on my face in the snow. And uh, about that time, these two, uh, there are only the only two there are these uh, state troopers, the uh, state law enforcement. And they come over and help me get up. And um, as they do, the sheriffs and deputies, a whole bunch of people milling around, and said, uh, this guy picks me up, and he said, uh, we just checked, and this guy's got warrants in Texas. We're, got, we're taking him in ourselves. So they picked me up, and they walked me around to the back of the car. As they're standing there, one guy's looking, and he's undoing my handcuffs. And then he puts me, and he said, sit down in the back seat. So they take that took the handcuffs off, stick me in the back seat. Both of them get in the car, engine running. It's cold, so the heaters are going. And they're asked, they turn around to me and they say to me, there's one guy that got away. We're not sure he is. He's got a, he's a short guy. He's got kind of long, curly, blonde hair. And it's, you know, about shoulder length. And uh, we saw him take off and we think he hit the river because it was right there by the Mississippi River. And I said, I think, we think he went in his water. Do you know who that might be? And I looked right at him and said, yeah, that's got to be Speedy. That's the only guy that looks like that. He's, he's one of the small little guy, but he's one of the characters of this group. And so anyway, that's his name is Speedy. So they, I, don't, I don't remember his last name, but that's who he is. So that's the only thing they asked me. They leave me in the car. These guys get out and I'm just sitting in the back of this car, car running. And by the time this is all unfolding, I swear it's been 45 minutes or an hour I'm sitting there because there's guys being arrested and hauled away. They're putting in squad cars. They're just commotion, just chaos, I guess you'd have to say. So I get hauled off going down to the Hennepin County Jail. Now, I was pulled aside in the back of this car because this red-headed deputy opens the door and flops his bad ass in there. And he says, okay, listen, there's some things I didn't tell you, but you're going to need to know. You're going to need to stay in jail at least two to three days because we've got to cool this down to make sure there's no suspicions. So... Anyway, when you get there, I need you to, there's going to be a guy that's going to be a trustee. He'll be a tall black guy. I need you to pull your, he's going to be taking you to your cell. I need you to pull your arm loose from him, turn around, and smack him in the face. And I was like, what? Just trust me. The trustees run this jail. They do, they do everything in it. And so we have to have an excuse to isolate you. So you just, when you get there... One of the trustees, after you've been fingerprinted and photographed and all that, he will be taken to a common cell with other people. When he does, he's going to, I'm going to tell him, don't take any shit from that guy. He'll grab you kind of firmly. You're going to pull loose from him and smack him in the face. God, all the crap I'd ever been told to hit a jailmate, an in inmate from a jail in the face. So anyway, I get in there and get arrested and booked. Two of these two officers are with the state troopers, they're actually in that room. So I'm getting fingerprinted and photographed and mugshot pictures and all this take left and right and pictures taken of me. And here's, you know, Troy Robert Lee is now arrested in Hennepin County Jail. And so I get all this done. This guy comes over and he was right. There was a tall kind of a light-skinned black man. And he's one of the trustees. And he's taken me by the arm to back the deal. So he, he kind of picks me up and kind of tries to shove me. Well, when he does, I just take it. That's the moment I'm supposed to raise in hell. So I jerk my arm loose, turn around, cold cock him right in the face. And when he does, of course, two other officers jump on me immediately. And right out, as soon as he did that, that red-headed deputy said, isolate his ass. Put, put him over, but put him in solitaire. And so I didn't go into the common jail cell with all these other guys. So, but, and they had to have a reason to isolate me and put me in a cell by myself. Now, I'm still being intended to, brought food, looked after by the trustees, which are the ones that run the jail, really. They're guys, guys that are inmates, but they do things, administrative things. They bring you your food. They do all that stuff. Okay, there's this one guy who is asking me questions, and they said this may happen because we don't know who knows who in this deal, and these guys could be so connected and so now that you're not among all of them, they're going to want to know what the hell the deal is. So he was asking me questions about things, and I was feeding him with lines of shit that like I was told to do about 
where I'm from and what's going on and that I've got warrants on me back in Texas and I just hope to God they don't figure that part out. And, and now there's a rumor going around the jail that this guy's wanted back in Texas and we're waiting on, ex the reason he's being held here even now is they're waiting on extradition papers. Come to find out later, that was the reason they had to hold me for a couple of days in jail because they knew that you don't get immediate extradition papers. It takes a minute to come from somewhere. How they, somehow they created these documents so that they seemed to the trustees when they got the faxes or whatever, they seemed real. They seemed like this is just another standard on board, you know, take this guy and shove it. I, I mean, I'm sleeping on a cotton tack mattress. It's about this thin on a metal bunk, three squares wearing jail, you, you know, jumpsuits. Um, I mean, the predicament that you find yourself in when all of a sudden you're just doing a job for somebody. And I'm getting paid by Target. I'm getting paid by Universal Investigations. And I'm trying to figure out that there might be a way to pay off some of my bills. So, finally, a third day, the trustees come and tell me that, well, your ride to Texas is here, Hot Rod. And so they cuff me in the jail cell, walk me out to the outside part. The same two Highway patrolmen, uh, state troopers, are standing there at the door waiting to receive me. So they process the deal, they sign paperwork, they got to take it to this place and get it done, and then they got to come over and release me into custody. And so they tell me when they give me these guys, these guys are going to take you to the airport. Don't worry, you've got a direct flight, and they introduce some other guy that's supposed to be some person that's going to accompany me. They're going to accompany me all the way back to Brownsville, Texas to be sure I get to where I'm supposed to go. Well, that guy goes outside. He gets in the car with us and the two state troopers and we all leave and we're supposedly driving to the airport. Only we don't do that. We drive to this hotel that's in St. Paul, Minnesota, next to Minneapolis. And we get to this hotel and we get out and I get out, they're taking the cuffs off me, and this other guy, who I have no idea who he is, who's supposed to be my escort to Texas, and when, I, when they let me open the doors and let me out, two of my bosses from Dallas were there, and they were standing there in this lobby of this hotel while walking me in. And of course, I'm still wearing my work clothes. I have nothing with me, anything other than just what I had on my back. And here's my two bosses, and they're looking at me, and grinning and shaking my hand and stuff. And um, he said, you know, you did a really good job there, Taylor. And uh, we're really proud of the work that you've done. Uh, we got everything that we wanted to accomplish. We got all of them, the entire crew. We know who they are now. We even know who they're connected to in the Minneapolis, you know, crime boss families of who all this was doing, this collecting over a million dollars a year in losses. Didn't been have it ongoing for years. They found out how they were doing it, when they were doing it. Anyway, it was a good conclusion. I go upstairs in the same hotel to a place where they said they were going to have dinner. And when I do, I walk in that room. And when I do, the CEO of Target is there. The man that hired me, the personnel director at the warehouse. And so is that manager and that assistant manager that hated my fucking guts. They're both sitting there at the table. So when I walk in the door, you would I just can't tell you how wonderful the expression on their faces were when they were being told, hey, you know what? This guy wasn't who you thought he was. He was working for us. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you what his real name is. It doesn't matter. He's going back to California, which is another piece of shit they're lying to them about. And we're going to be seeing that he gets out of here and so anyway, we want you guys to know that this was all with the help of a company here and they introduced the principals with the Universal Investigations who had signed this contract for the security detail to do this under, industrial undercover work. And uh, anyway, Jane drove up there in our car, picked me up at this little motel the next day. She was con contacted about uh, where to find me given a bunch of expense money and cash to come pick me up, take me back to Texas. 
And uh, I had a memory that I'll never forget. I was scared out of my wits a lot of the times. I was, I got myself into a predicament that deal on that show that there was nothing like that that could ever happen in your life again. But uh, when I got home, I didn't stay working for Universal Investigations very long. I took all the money that I'd earned and went and paid all my bills. <clears throat> Come to find out, I was damn near broke again. And I had to, but I knew that there was a guy on Pecos who owed me some money. And so I was going to take that little rock that Dad bought and fly it out there and see if I could call him and pick up some money. Next time I talk to you, I'll tell you about that trip. That was another hellish experience. Anyway, sorry this one was longer, but it's just the story is what it is. That was the time I was working for undercover the Target stores in Fredley, Minnesota, in the Target warehouse. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye.